Miss Tyler. Okay, we should get started. Our time is moving on. Welcome again. Thanks for joining us. And uh, yeah, I'll pray and then we'll get... Yeah, final five for faith. Just double check your mics on there while I pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, just want to bow before you. We just want to thank you again, Lord, just for who you are, Lord. Just thank you even for Sunday, this first day of the week, and just that you've set it apart in a special way for your worship. And Lord, just to be able to come together as a church family tonight is... Just part of the blessing of that. And so, Father, I pray that you would bless our time together. Thank you for the food that we've enjoyed. And just again, may we learn, may we, would you teach us tonight, we pray. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, before Melissa gets going with her game, uh, so let me, our game, uh, right after, let me think about this. I have to think about the order. Right after Dave, when Dave's done, normally Amanda would spring up, but we'll be doing a video. So just so you guys know, when you see the video come on the screen and the lights will probably dim, that's Amanda teaching us. She's teaching from home this week. You still don't have Melissa? You still don't have me? Mm. That's okay. Here, just use the hand. So. I, on. This is normally what happens in our house. <laughs> Try to solve a problem that solves itself. <laughs> okay, so we have our Valentine's candy up at the front on the stage. Yes. You get, if you stand up five Ooh. times, you can come on up for all um, and grab your Valentine's chocolate. So we're back to, you're just gonna stand up if you've done the things that we are say, talking about tonight. And how many do you have to get right to get a candy? We've done five, do you wanna keep with five? Yeah, we'll keep well, it Well, do five. you want chocolate left over or do you want it all gone? Well, we'll decide <laughs> halfway through how many chocolates are left. <laughs> so we'll, <laughs> we'll go with five. Okay, so five right answers or five. If you stand up five times, then you get to come and get a chocolate. Okay, first number one. Actually, stand up if you have read the entire Bible. Not in a year, but over, you know, if you have read the whole Bible. Very cool. Have a look around. That's pretty neat. Awesome. Okay, you guys can be seated. So if you speak more than one language, please stand up. Uh, you have to have at least like five to ten sentences. You know. <laughs> Intelligible. It's true. Well done. Okay, stand up if you have been in someone's wedding party. So if you've been a bridesmaid or best man, a flower girl, that kind of thing. Wow, that's a lot of people. Cool. Okay, you guys can be seated. And then if you have never been on a roller coaster, stand up. If you've never been on a roller coaster. <laughs> really? Just, and count. Just count. Oh. Okay. Young adults, this summer, <laughs> get Callum on a roller coaster. <laughs> okay, so stand up. I'll take the next one since it's connected. Stand up if you hate roller coasters. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, number, next one. Stand up if you have grown a vegetable from a seed. So planted a seed and harvested a vegetable. Nice. Nice, good. Oh, anybody had five? Nobody, okay. Um, oh, stand up if you have gone swimming in a lake during winter time. Oh, Steve and Julie, nice. <laughs> oh, five, nice. <laughs> Stand up. Or we're at number 11. <laughs> no, I'll do nine. Stand up <laughs> if you have more than 10 pairs of shoes. More than 10 pairs of shoes. Stand up. <laughs> So, Andrew, you should sit down. Yeah, exactly. 
Okay, next one. Stand up if you have cut your own hair. <laughs> Whether on purpose or by accident. That is too many people. <laughs> Dave, Dave Gray has cut his own hair. Well, so technically when you shave. Okay, you can stand up if you have had stitches. If you've had stitches, stand up. Nice. Okay, we'll just do a couple more. Stand up if you have eaten at one point in your life an entire box of cookies by yourself. And one setting? Right, because everybody's eaten a whole box of cookies. Not without sharing. Oh, right, I guess. You're talking about one box. Okay, we'll just do a couple more here. Stand up if you are a twin. Really? No one here. Yes, we get to keep the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got one? I do. Stand up if you have never ridden in an ambulance. Okay, stand up if you have ridden in a convertible. So if you've ridden in a convertible, stand up. Nice. Okay, and one last one for tonight. <laughs> Is it 20? Yeah. Stand up if you have opened up a box of Lucky Charms and only eaten the marshmallows. <laughs> <laughs> it's just wrong. It's a blend, the blend of both. It's important. Anyways, thank you for playing along with us these last five weeks. I hope you've had a chance to look around and see, get to know some different things about different people. Um, we don't have an interview for tonight, so That's we're right. going to invite Pastor Don up. Up you come. I wanted Andrew and Melissa to interview each other and tell us, ask each other questions that we wouldn't know, but I couldn't get them to go along with it. We are into the last week for Martin Luther's story. Um, and so last week, if you were here, we kind of covered his, his marriage and his family. And so we're picking up in the year 1525 when he got married, and we're going to cover about 21 years till his death. Uh, minus sort of family life, which is sort of interesting because it's kind of generally regarded that about the last 15 or 20 years of Martin Luther's life was sort of the most unimportant part. Most of what he wrote that we would know about him or from him was written in the early part of his life. Uh, and uh, it's sort of funny to me because they say it was sort of like the unimportant part of his life. All he did was essentially pastor a church full of people. Uh, it's like, well, that feels like it was actually quite important. So that is the man we're talking about. Um, over those last 15 years or so, as I mentioned, um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the things he did do, but uh, he lived with his wife, he raised a family, he pastored a church, he led a university, so he wasn't, un, you know, he wasn't uh, sort of kicking back and relaxing, but uh, the last major sort of chapter of his life took place over the last few years, uh, because while he was li busy living in Wittenberg, back home where he'd grown up, uh, there was a major dispute between a number of very wealthy, very prominent landowners. And um, the dispute affected Luther's family. If you remember way back to the start, Martin Luther's dad had become a miner. Um, and so this area where Martin Luther's family had stayed was a lot of like copper mining and those kind of things. And so Luther was concerned for his own family. And so he traveled back and basically functioned as a mediator. And over a couple years managed to bring peace to this very significant conflict that was actually, believe it or not, leading towards what looked like was going to be war. So that was sort of what he was doing over the last couple years of his life, traveling back and forth, which brings us to his final few days. And actually, we've got a picture, we can put it up, uh, of the couch. This is a, a fairly famous couch that if you were to visit Germany and travel around and see Martin Luther memorabilia, this is the couch where he uh, was famously have known to be dying on this couch. So you could go and see the couch where Martin Luther was dying. Um, as he traveled back for the last meeting to mediate, he started having heart issues. In fact, he had a series of heart attacks on the trip back to um, Mansfeld and Eisenberg where he was dying, um, or where he was going to mediate, sorry, and he did pass away uh, after he had brought that mediation to a close. So on February 17th, he brought an end to this conflict, and that night, 
He had a stroke and a series of heart attacks, and we can show the house. This is the house where he was staying that night, and on February 18th, he passed away. So there is actually a, a fairly significant celebration for people, particularly more in like the Lutheran type of churches on February 18th, in honor of Martin Luther. But what I wanna to talk to you about a little bit is sort of his legacy. Like, what's he known for? And we would know some things. Probably the main one that we would know him for is some of what Dave's been talking about in his, his section because he was known for uh, what has been called the, the formula principle. Through grace alone, or sorry, by grace alone, through faith alone, according to scripture alone. That idea was really the idea that Luther contributed. He's been called the reluctant reformer because Luther never intended to leave the Catholic Church. In fact, it's kind of debated whether he really started the Lutheran church or not, it certainly didn't have his name. He was very resistant to having his name ever used as a church. He wanted to call it the evangelical church, interestingly enough. Um, but because of what he was teaching, he ended up not being Catholic. I mean, that principle alone, by scripture alone, not by the Pope, kind of had him excommunicated from the church. So he was starting to still pastor and preach and teach in churches, but they just didn't happen to be Catholic churches. After his death, the Lutheran church began. It took on his name and uh, grew to, I think, at its height, about 70 million people around the world. It's not quite that many anymore. So that would definitely be one of his major, um, one of his major contributions. Oh, I was gonna mention the very last thing he wrote. This is kind of an interesting thing. They found this after his death. They knew he wrote it that day. Here's what he wrote. In almost all Latin, no one can understand Virgil's bucolics unless he's been a shepherd for five years. No one can understand Virgil's uh, Georgics unless he has been a farmer for five years. No one can understand Cicero's letters unless he has busied himself in the state of affairs of the state for 20 years. No one has indulged in the holy writers sufficiently until he's governed churches for 100 years with the prophets Elijah Elisha, John the Baptist, and the apostles. Just kind of an interesting statement. After a whole lifetime of studying scripture, he said basically, it barely began to scratch the surface. And he ended just with these words in German, we are all beggars. Which kind of actually is a fairly fitting thing when you think about kind of his life of just coming to that place of understanding that we're saved by grace alone. So that was probably the major contribution. Um, but let me just go through the quick list of why Luther has become so prominent. Firstly, he translated the Bible into German. That was monumental. Secondly, he wrote a ton of music. A Mighty Fortress is Our God was one of the songs he wrote during that 15 year sort of quiet time of his life. Uh, the major thing he said he claimed himself to have written, even though he wrote over 110 books, he said you could burn them all, just don't burn the little cat catechism, which was what he wrote to teach kids about Jesus because he said that's, that's the most important thing he did. He really raised the view and esteem of marriage within not just the church, but sort of all of Europe, and um, brought about some huge steps in the Reformation itself, even though I said he was very reluctant. He didn't view himself as a, as a reformer. But he also had one very troubling thing, and I want to just mention it. Many of you would know it. And I think when we tell stories of people who are, who are well-known and famous, we want to be careful we tell the whole story. One of the, the hardest parts of his legacy, particularly over the last three years of his life, was that he wrote and said some very difficult things about Jewish people. Um, some people today would claim he was an anti-Semite. The, the, the reality is, at his time in, in Germany, he probably never in his life actually knew a Jew. All the Jews had been kicked out of Germany back at that point. And he started out his life very pro-Jewish people, believing that, that they needed to hear the gospel, they could come to Christ. But as they, as they didn't, there wasn't a move towards Christ, he became very embittered towards them and wrote some fairly, fairly difficult and what we would say very wrong things. And so there's this mixed bit of legacy when it comes to Luther's life, particularly with that issue. Um, we do need to bear in mind that as he was writing most of those things over the last few years, he was suffering with huge physical issues. He had developed a, an inner ear problem. His inner ear had burst, and so he had uh, ringing in his ear. He had, there was a disease, Meniere's disease or something like that, where he couldn't stand up properly. He couldn't hear properly. His balance was out. He was almost always nauseated. He had kidney stones. He had a lot of different physical issues going on that left him hurting a lot. And I'm way over my time, but let me just share, if I could, just a couple fascinating things of Luther. This isn't his legacy. This is just stuff that I learned along the way that I found just fascinating that I couldn't figure where else to put in. His actual last name wasn't Luther. It was Luther. He changed it deliberately because Luther in German was similar to the Greek word for free man. And so when he came to Christ, when he came to that understanding, he changed his name. Uh, second, 
He knew how to sew. He actually made and repaired his own clothing. Thirdly, he lived in a monastery with his wife and family, but he built himself a bowling alley. That just seems kind of cool. Uh, he didn't use a fork. He believed that forks were like a pitchfork that reminded him of the devil. And so he actually said at one point, God preserve me from a little fork. Um, <clears throat> He lived in a time of a lot of sickness and a lot of plagues, and there was a lot of debate within the Christian community. Should, we, should people stay in the cities during times of plague and help, or should they flee? He always chose to stay. It probably led to the death of his second child that we talked about um, a couple weeks ago. Let me just find the rest of my little list here. There's just a couple more. Again, I just sort of found them intriguing. Here we go. Um, number seven, he was what we might call today an animal activist. He was fundamentally opposed to hunting. There's actually a story told that uh, some people were out hunting um, and an animal ran up his leg, a rabbit ran up his, his leg and the hunting dogs actually attacked him and he tried to protect this animal from uh, being hunted. He was also a famous woodworker and gardener. He never took a wage for most of his career. So near the end of his life, he made woodwork to support his family. Um, and if we go through just a couple quick pictures here, there's his tomb. There's the German Bible. There is a picture of Martin Luther, a statue. There we go, there he is in the middle. This is a fairly famous monument. These are kind of figures of the Reformation. I won't go through them all, uh, but suffice it to say, the guy in the middle on the tallest one, that's Luther. And uh, I think we'll wrap it up and carry on with the rest of the five solos. So our fifth and final sola is sola deo gloria, glory to God alone. And probably this was the most difficult one for me to try and figure out how to speak to it in just a few minutes, because um, there's just so many different avenues you could take uh, when you're looking at the glory of God. <clears throat> so all I can really do is, uh, is kind of scratch the surface of it, but I hope that you guys will take the time to really look into the Reformation principles and the solas and uh, see the depth of the theology that's there. Uh, Romans 11, 33 to 36. And we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, but I just want to read it again. Um, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and untraceable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has first given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. All things exist by God and for God. He conceived them all. He made them and he fashioned and purposed them for his pleasure and his own glory. The whole of creation exists for the manifestation of God and the praise of God. Now, many people rebel against that truth because it opposes their pride and their false notion of autonomy but the rebellion doesn't change the fact of it. And if we really think about it, how could any created thing be the end in and of itself over and against its creator? How could the creature ever usurp the creator? How could any derived and dependent being ever compare with the source of its very existence? It's both unbiblical and illogical. The preeminence of God is a primary principle. It's a foundational truth upon which other truths rest. It's self-evident in both creation and redemption that God is the author, he is the doer, and he is the objective. In verse 36 in Romans 11, for from him and through him and to him are all things. From him, it's his conception, his idea, he's the author. It's through him, it's by his doing. He's the energy, the force, the worker. And it's to him. He is the end, the purpose, the objective. We can see the glory of God in creation. He conceived of the heavens and the earth and everything that's in them. He spoke them into being. And he sustains them. We learn in Psalms 19 and Romans 1 that creation testifies to God's wisdom, power, and nature. They glorify God. We see the glory of God in redemption. God chooses. He calls he regenerates the heart. He gives faith. He atones. 
He's the one that justifies, and it's his righteousness that's imputed to us. He does all the work of reconciliation. Hebrews 12 and Philippians 1, he is the author, perfecter, and completer of salvation. <clears throat> How God's preeminence and his glory can also be seen in the solas that we've been looking at. It's actually the point of the solas. The solas are statements which encapsulate the glory of God that's expressed in the actions of God, which result from the nature of God. Scripture alone. God is the author of his word. He's the sustainer of his, preserver of his word. And it's his nature that gives his word authority. Grace alone. We looked at how God's grace is the impetus for his kindness toward us. Faith alone. God actually grants the faith, which is the means of appropriating his grace. Christ alone. It's Christ himself who atones for our sin and justifies us. So literally everything is from him, through him, and to him. Recognizing and submitting to the glory of God, to the preeminence of God, is the very first step in aligning ourselves with reality. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's the first effect of regeneration. It's the humility which God then blesses with grace. Proverbs 3.34, James 4.6, 1 Peter 5.5, 5, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God made man to bear his image and to worship him. Not giving God his due reverence is the foundation or the base or the starting point of sin. It's the correlating effect of pride. Now quickly, when men and women seek their own glory, they always exalt themselves at the expense and detriment of others. They are seeking something they were never meant to have, that they are unworthy of, and that they can't carry. But this is not so with God. His glory is essential to his very being. It's not something he pursues trying to achieve it. It's something he already inherently has and that he manifests. He isn't pursuing it at the expense of others. There are no others. He has no equal, no rival, no other to which he ought to share his glory with. His pursuit and revelation of his own glory doesn't diminish anyone. In fact, it's the glory of God which sustains everyone. Far from being something which devalues or disparages or debases mankind, the glory of God is the very satisfaction of man if only he will humble himself before God. I'm just going to leave you um, with this quote from C.S. Lewis. In God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. Welcome to Sword Keepers. Uh, this week I'm doing a lesson via video because my family is stuck at home with COVID this week. So I decided it'd be better to just stay home. Um, so let's start from the top with everything we've memorized so far. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism one God and Father of all. So when our hands are down like this for one baptism, the kind of the shorter hand on the, at the front here will go up first. So one God and Father of all. We'll do that together. One God and Father of all, who is over all, so he is all powerful, he is over all things, who is over all and through all, he works through all things, so who is over all, and through all, and in all. So we are united in him. He is through us. He is in us. He works through all things. 
This whole passage is about unity, and we are bonded together in unity through God. Um, let's do from one baptism. One baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So when you're doing and through all, you're kind of moving your hands down, like almost a slicing motion. So who is over all and through all and in all. So let's go from the very top. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We're going to do it all the way from the top again smiles and just thinking about the meaning of these words that we're saying thinking about the meaning of these verses as well ready ephesians 4 verses 1 through 6 i therefore a prisoner for the lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness with patience bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all and in all. Good job. This has been really fun for me to memorize with everyone. I'm really bummed out that I can't be there today for the last week. Um, just a reminder, if you're interested in joining Sword Keepers, it's not just for kids. I love to do groups with um, teenagers or seniors or even if it's a group of young moms who wants to memorize. I do video tutorials like this one and they get put online and then you just watch at home online on your own time to memorize it. So. Um, yeah, it's not like a weekly commitment that you have to go anywhere. Um, so you can just memorize at home. But uh, I hope that this has kind of opened your mind maybe to the, the ways that you can memorize using actions to help you remember the words that you've been learning. Thanks. Have a great week. Well, welcome back. Welcome back to Snapshots from Bible School, where uh, if you're new here, we take one of our Miller students and ask them one thing they've been learning, and Donovan's already coming up, and he's going to share one thing he has learned that God has taught him this year through Miller, so time to hand off the mic to Donovan. Thanks, Max. Hello, everyone. I'm Donovan. As Max said, I'm a student at Miller, uh, where I'm learning and growing in just a lot of really cool ways. I'm going to talk about just one of those, even though I could talk for hours about it. Um, so I'm sure I'm not alone when I say that finding quality time with God is one of the hardest things when life gets busy or when there's just other commitments. Um, sometimes all that we have time for is 15 minutes in a day, and sometimes we have time for a couple hours. Um, but more and more, we waste that time or we just read quickly and forget about what we've read as we go about our day. Sometimes our Bible reading is wonderful, but... I've found for me, it's really hard to feel just the significance and the glory of the truth of the Bible and actually apply it to my life. I just read it, I think, wow, that's awesome, and I go about my day and don't really practice what it says. So I'd like to offer everyone here just a method for getting the most out of your Bible study, um, your quiet time with God. Um, I've adapted this from David Mathis' book, um, Habits of Grace, which you should all read and a little bit of influence thrown in there from the guys at the Bible Project. So uh, Bible meditation is when Bible reading turns into prayer. Uh, it begins to take root in our heart. But first, let me ask, why do we read the Bible? 
First reason, we read it to get more of Jesus. Um, we read it to, to hear from him in his word. And we read it because it's God's word to us, uh, which is designed to help us live wisely in light of the truth of who he is. Whenever I open my Bible, I wanna have those things in mind. So what do we do? Um, I'd like to offer this. Um, so first thing you do is pray. Then you just to ask the Spirit to lead you and guide you in that time. The next thing is to look at your, your Bible reading text. The next thing is to learn just the truths of the wisdom that help you apply it. And then you pray again. So I'll just go through that um, step by step. So number one, pray. Something short, maybe something like, um, Lord, help me see the wonderful truths of your word or ask the Spirit to direct your time. The next step is open your Bible. Um, it's a good idea to have some idea where you're gonna be reading, maybe on a Bible reading plan or just working through a book at a time. Um, so yeah, work your way through that book and then just read what you have time for that day. You don't have to race through chapters at a time. Uh, while you're reading, be observing the text for repeated words or key, uh, key points and ask good questions like, does this passage remind me of any other scripture passage? Or how is this theme related to Jesus and the gospel? Take note in your margins of your Bible or in a notebook uh, about any reasons that you can find to praise God or anything that teaches you wisdom. So take notes while you're reading just so that you can reflect back later. And I say wisdom instead of application because wisdom is a blend of knowing and doing. It's it's knowing the truth about God and letting that shape your actions. It's instead of just obedience about um, what the text says, it's obedience in light of who Jesus has proved himself to be. So under my knowing column, I'll write down a truth or a principle I found in the passage, um, and then I, I write down next to that in another column what, what that means for my life and how I should live in light of that truth. Um, you can do this kind of thing in one verse, or you can do this over a whole chapter. But make sure that you're not reading that verse in isolation from the rest of the text. Always keep it in its context so that you understand what it's talking about. So once you've, you've finished unpacking that chapter or that verse, the next step is to pray through it. Begin with your passage. Look at your praise column and praise God for the things that you found in that text that are reasons to be thankful or grateful um, or just glorify him um, for those things. Then ask him to help you know and live in light of what he's taught you in that um, wisdom column that you wrote down. In your prayer, let the spirit direct your heart and mind to those around you. Maybe there's someone um, in your family or your friends or your coworkers, your pastors or your missionaries that God is directing your heart to pray for. Um, one of the cool things that I've been challenged with is that the, the truths that we learn in scripture are never meant to stay with us. They're always meant to be shared with the people around us so that we can help grow each other and disciple each other. So if you add this kind of um, meditative Bible study to your morning routine, you'll find yourself thinking about this passage throughout your whole day um, because you, you've kind of just developed that text um, in a way that makes it understandable and it's just sitting in your head all day. And it can be done with just half an hour in a few verses or with an hour of actual um, good deep study and looking at cross-references. So that's all I have. I pray that the Lord would bless you guys as you um, make the most of your word and draw near to you in prayer. I'll just quickly summarize what I said. So there's, you pray quickly, you open your Bible um, in an expected way uh, where you know you're gonna be seeing God. You take note of what's praiseworthy about him and what he's trying to teach you to know and do and then you pray through that list and let the Spirit direct you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Donovan, and now Ephesians with uh, Pastor Andrew. Well, our last time of looking at that word walk and what we can learn from it, so I wanna read um, in Ephesians 5, and I'm going to read Ephesians 5, verse 15 to 21. Make sure you listen to the text, because there's a lot in that. Um, and you know what, it's one of those, if you forget everything I say, just try to remember what the text says. Um, so, it says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And, and so you probably caught it there in the first verse, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. So obviously the first two words are important, look, look carefully or pay attention or make it a priority, right? It's again, he's drawn their attention to what he's just about to say and saying, hey, make sure you do this, right? And so he wants them to walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And again, just thinking back to how we've been defining that, it's that reality of sort of something that uh, in our identity that is gonna be seen in our, in our everyday life, in our actions, in our priorities, and how, we, and how we live. And so we are gonna be living out wisdom. We're gonna be living out the wisdom that we have received from God. And you can see there when Paul is writing to them, it's sort of with that assumption that they are wise, right? He's right, writing to Christians, and he's saying, hey, live as though you're wise because you are wise. Right, and it's really drawn out that same kind of wisdom in the sense that you see in Matthew 7, 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And so that wisdom that is just seen in the one who is living their life and, and accepted Christ as savior. And so you see that the wisdom of, sort of that wisdom category of describing the believers and saying, look, because of what Christ has done, because of his wisdom and because of the gospel that you've received, then share that wisdom with those round about you. Live a life that puts that wisdom on display. And so you can see these ways that the wise are described. Uh, the first one is that they make the best use of the time. That's what the next little passage says, make the best use of the time because the days are evil. And so it's really speaking of taking every opportunity. So again, taking every opportunity to share or to live out that wisdom. Again, it's easy to say that. It's easy to understand that's the principle, but let's be honest, we have to always keep coming back to that, that priority of just being kingdom focused and of making the most of every opportunity I'm sure you've had it where maybe you've had an opportunity for a little bit of a conversation or an opportunity to practically show God's love to somebody. And then, of course, that sort of common sense part of your mind is kicking in, but I gotta get the groceries, and I gotta get here, and I gotta get there, and I'm in a rush, and I need to do this, and I need to do that. And not to say that you shouldn't stay on task. That's not the point. Um, but it's just that reality of making the most of uh, the best use of the time, being efficient, um, but also seeing the opportunities that God has given us. Because the days are evil, it's just in the contrast of uh, a lack of wisdom. So in the contrast or in the setting in which we are surrounded by those who don't know the Lord and who don't know his wisdom, then our wisdom, we're gonna make the best use of the time to share that wisdom. The next way we can live out our wisdom is to understand what the will of the Lord is. That's the, the second little thing that you see. Um, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so again, it's that understanding that we know God is ultimately wise and we want his wisdom to be seen in every area of our lives. And so we desire his will. We desire his will. Just like the Lord's prayer, your will be done on earth as it is on heaven, right? Because that's the ultimate source of wisdom is, uh, is his will being done. And so again, just the, the life that will display that, uh, that sort of wise person is gonna be seen that they are always trying to seek to do the will of the Lord and always making that a priority. Again, not easy, but this is what Paul is calling us to. Um, and then the third one that we'll be known by is being filled with the Spirit, right? That's what it says next. Uh, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And it's that sort of the negative and the positive that we've already been looking at. So don't do one thing, but do this instead, right? And so he's saying, don't get drunk with wine, but rather be filled with the Spirit. Now, it's not saying that the Holy Spirit brings the same fruit as getting drunk with wine, right? Like where you're out of control and, you know, that kind of thing, like where you've lost your senses. That's not his point. But it has, does have to do with control and being under the influence, right? Where it's saying that in every area of our lives, um, that the Holy Spirit, we should be filled with the Spirit. And of course, it's that ongoing tense where it's not a one-time deal, but just always seeking to be filled with the Spirit. And so just to repeat that a little bit, um, we're, we're living out 
We're living our lives as wise, or we're walking as wise people. So what do we do? We make the best use of the time. We understand what the will of the Lord is. We're to keep being filled with the Spirit. And then he ends with, what does that look like? What does it look like whenever you're filled with the Spirit? And then you see that, again, the priorities. And it's four things, which I'll just mention, and then I'm done. We are addressing, which again, nobody really uses the word in that sense, um, but that's what the, the word is in the Bible here. So we're to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, right? So we are addressing, um, oh, and then what's the next one? Yes, yeah, singing, of course, if I just read it, it's right there in front of me. We're to address one another, we're singing, then we're thanking, and then we're submitting, right? And so it's that evidence of the Spirit-filled life. And it's, it's interesting that it's all to do with what we can do for other people and how that being filled with the Spirit is seen and affects those around about us. Because again, that's been sort of Paul's argument all along is that when we walk, or when we're walking in a way or living in a way that reflects what is, God has done in us, it's really gonna build up the community round about. And that's really his desire for us and uh, what he would want to see happen here at Emmanuel. So again, just thanks guys for listening. And uh, yeah, I should have said earlier when I mentioned about the video, you'll also notice some of the other regular presenters are not here tonight. So um, you'll catch on, you'll figure it out. We'll keep you on your toes. <laughs> and with that, Roxanne, our guest presenter. All right, tonight I'm gonna ask Hannah Euphemzef to come up and she's going to be telling us a little bit about her testimony. I feel my age a little bit tonight. Um, Hannah and my son went to kindergarten together. So I've actually known Hannah since she was four. So, um, but anyways, yes. I was, I was young too at that time. But. So anyways, um, Hannah. So first of all, tell us a little bit about your growing up years in your family. Uh, so I grew up in a Christian household. My parents are both believers and uh, they brought me to church almost every single Sunday that I could remember. Um, and yeah, I just really looked to my parents to show me what it was to be a Christian and the way that they brought me up. Does that work? Yes, that works great. <laughs> and um, also, I'm curious to know then from your early training and experience at church. When did you first come to realize that you personally needed God in your life? It took me up until I was about 13 years old to figure out that the gospel actually included me in the story. Um, up until then, I just thought that it was like, there's sinners out there and God saved them, but that happened and it wasn't necessary for me. Um, so it took me I think 13, I heard the song about Christ on the cross and how he looks at me with such a deep love and that's when I was like, okay, that's me. I need a savior to save me from my sins. Okay, so tell us a little bit about what God has been showing you in this last year of your life. Um, he's been, I guess, showing me the importance of having a community and a church family to confide in versus confiding in, say, the world and just how valuable it is to have each other and just look out for the safety and well-being of our souls. Yeah. Tell us a little bit um, about where you work and how you have a chance to even shine that light in your work environment. <laughs> I'm an early childhood educator. I work at a daycare, and I'm so thankful that part of my job is that I just get to love the kids, the parents, uh, my own coworkers, and just, I don't know, try to be chipper every day showing up. <laughs> awesome, thank you very much.
Okay, so Josh and I are doing trivia in the absence of Pastor Dave. So we will go ahead and get started with that. The question for at home will still be text. The answer you can still text to Pastor Dave's number for those of you at home. And the question there is from this from this summer sermon series in Proverbs. Can you name one of the things God hates? So yeah, if you're at home, go ahead and send that to Pastor Dave, and he will be on the lookout for that. And now we're gonna pick our names for trivia here. Sorry, can you get me? Simon. <laughs> Donovan. <laughs> And Keziah. <laughs> okay. So go ahead and stand in front of a bell. You can spread them out a bit if you need to. And I'm actually gonna have you guys put your hands on your head so that it takes you a minute to get to the bell. <laughs> okay, so your question is, after leaving his home, Jacob stopped, took a rock, and fell asleep. He had a dream. In the morning after his dream, what did Jacob, what name did Jacob give the place he was at? <laughs> Donovan. Bethel. Yes, Bethel or the house of God. <laughs> Good job. Okay, you guys can get a candy if you'd like <laughs> on your way down. And Donovan, you get to spin the wheel for a prize. <laughs> Okay, let me see. <laughs> yeah, are you sure you want that one or do you want a different one? <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> you want that one? Okay. <laughs> you get to open it. You can bring the box over to the table and show us what you got. <laughs> A hammock! <laughs> Someone finally got the hammock. Pastor Dave will be so happy. <laughs> All right. I don't know who's up next, but... That's me. I was thinking he was supposed to spin it again. I've just learned whenever anyone's up here, it's like, are you sure you want that one? The correct answer is no. I think I'll keep spinning. Uh, we are going back to Israel for one last time. And I do hope, if you ever, if you ever get the chance to go, just go. Um, you will not be disappointed. Now, um, if you were to do a trip to Israel, like say like a typical sort of a 10-day trip, probably four or five of those days are going to be in Jerusalem. It's the crown jewel, right? Uh, in Israel, you'd always say you're going up to Jerusalem, partly because of the geography, but partly because it's just, it's the main place. So here we are uh, kind of standing on the Mount of Olives, uh, looking out over Jerusalem. So that would be kind of a fairly, fairly main sort of viewpoint that you would get. Uh, there's sort of an aerial shot of Jerusalem. Um, and I'm going to show you three spots. But before we do, I just wanted to mention one quick thing. Um, where do archaeologists dig? Not a trick question. Down, right? You ever wonder why? Because in Canada, when we demolish a building, you ever notice they come in, they bring the crews, they just kind of like clean it right away. There's nothing left. You know, if we demolished something and you dug down, there would be nothing to find. But in the ancient world, rather than doing that, typically what they would do is like a war would come or something would happen, the building would be demolished, it would just kind of be flattened, and then they would build on top of it and just kind of keep going. And so in the ancient world, when you're doing archaeology, you dig down. So I'm going to show you just a couple pictures of, if you can kind of see up at the very top, that's like modern day ground level. And then you see what the archaeologists have had to do. They've had to start digging down. You see all the stairways, they get down level after level after level. The deeper you go, the older you're getting. So you can see in a picture like that, or we have a couple other just sort of quick pictures here. 
Uh, so you can go to the next one. There we are. Here we are in the middle of the city, right? So you see there's, there's like the road, and there's where we had to get to start seeing old stuff. So it's actually kind of interesting. There are places where there's literally people's houses, and then it's like they want to get underneath the house, so they start like propping up the house and building like giant scaffold type stuff underneath the houses to be able to see what happened thousands of years ago. I think I have one or two more pictures of just kind of what this is like as you start getting down all these different levels. And then one last one, the Pool of Bethsaida. So this is actually a biblical site. And again, you can kind of see, see where the trees are. That's like today's level, but way down below is the Pool of Bethsaida. Uh, so when you do get to Israel, make sure you look down. I guess that's the moral of the story. Now, the, the three sites I want to show you, um, one from the Old Testament and then two from the New Testament. The Old Testament one, uh, let's move to the next slide, is a tunnel. Uh, and don't, don't be afraid when you get to Israel to take up the opportunity to go through this tunnel. This is Hezekiah's tunnel. So in, uh, in the Old Testament, there's a story when, when the Assyrians come and they're going to attack Hezekiah because he has refused to be loyal to Assyria. So they send their army. They're going to destroy Hezekiah in the city of Jerusalem. Here's what we find out. This is reading in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. After these things, after the acts of faithfulness, Sennacherib king of Assyria came, invaded Judah, encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw Sennacherib had come, he intended to fight. He planned with his officers and his mighty men to stop the water of the springs outside the city. Isn't that an interesting thing? So there was a spring outside the city of Jerusalem. The king knew, Hezekiah knew, Sennacherib and the Assyrians are going to come, and if they come, we won't have water. We can't go out to get water anymore. So they, they covered it up, and then it doesn't say in 2 Chronicles what they do. It just says they covered it up to protect their water source. But when we go over to 2 Kings, and we read this last description of the lit life of Hezekiah, here's what it says. The rest of the deeds of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made the pool, that's that's the story of this. And the conduit and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of Chronicles and the book of the kings of Judah? So this is, this is the tunnel he dug, well, probably not him personally, but that he had dug to get to the water outside the city. It's 1,750 feet long. The amazing thing is they know they dug from both directions at the same time. Remember, there's an enemy coming. You got to do this quick. And they tunneled underground 1,750. Uh, 1,750 feet, and it's still filled with water today, as you can see from a picture. There's a guy. So when you go there and walk through it, make sure you wear something that can get wet, because there'll probably be water. Uh, and I think maybe we have one last picture. Um, there we go. So you'll want to take a flashlight when you go through the tunnel. But it's pretty epic to see that what happened in Second Chronicles is a place you can visit and walk through still today, and you can see where Hezekiah had dug. Fascinating thing, they still aren't entirely 100% sure how they managed to pull this off even kind of in modern day sort of understanding of engineering, all these kind of things, to accomplish this feat is actually fairly extraordinary to think. Imagine, they dug underground, coming from two directions, and managed, even though it's turning corners, to meet in the middle. And I think they missed by something like, it's about a 12 inch or something, sort of just in elevation, but they managed to meet up perfectly. Um, the other spots I wanna show you are back at the Temple Mount. So. Um, in about the year 300 and something, um, the, the emperor of Rome converted to Christianity. His mother, a woman by the name of Helena, decided who, she was also a Christian, decided to take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, or to Israel, sorry, and she wanted to travel around and see all the places where Jesus had gone. Up to that point, no one was particularly interested to know where Jesus had gone because there weren't a lot of Christians that were traveling to Jerusalem or to Israel. And so as she came and wanted to see the places, she would travel around asking people, well, where did he multiply the bread and the loaves? And they weren't always sure. And so when you go to Israel today, a lot of times people will say, well, this is the traditional site. What they mean by that is this is the spot where Helena came along and said, Right here is where that thing happened that you're reading. So some of the places we don't really know, uh, and if you visit a, a certain place, it may or may not be. But I want to show you one place where we know for sure where Jesus actually walked. Because if you go to Jerusalem or you go to Israel, you want to be able to see where Jesus walked. So um, this is sort of a model of the temple. Now, I want you to look down in this bottom corner. There's a Robinson's Arch in this corner. Um, now, in the New Testament, we know Jesus visited the temple a number of times, and then one day, as he was talking to his disciples, they came out, and actually, I'll read you the passage here real quick, in Mark chapter 13. As they came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and wonderful buildings. 
You can imagine they were looking back at that. And then Jesus said this, do you see these great buildings? There will be not left here one stone on another that will not be thrown down. Now, the strange thing is, who would ever be interested? Can you go back for a second to that last picture? Who would ever want to actually take all the stones from all the buildings on top of that thing and actually throw them off? Who would go to all the effort? Well, amazingly, the rebellion that happened in Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Romans came in. They were so upset that they decided to just simply clear, flatten everything and throw it off the edge. Over the years, there's slowly been excavations. And so if we go to the next slide, this is what they found. It's actually been excavated not all that long ago. It was buried way, 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 way under. And what you're going to see there is actually a pile of stones that were from the temple that the Romans pushed off the top of that temple mount and fulfilled exactly what Jesus said was going to happen there in that passage in Mark. But I got to leave you with one last spot so that you can actually see a spot where Jesus actually would have walked. And the reason we know this is because these are the main stairs that led into the temple. These are really the only stairs. And if you look, they're all uneven. They're different shapes and sizes. They did that on purpose so that no one could walk into the temple proudly looking up or talking to people. You had to look down to make sure you didn't trip. And as you were looking down, you couldn't talk, so you'd be focused on worshiping God. And so when you read the stories of Jesus coming in and out of the temple, we know this would have been the, the entrance and the exit. And so you can go and read in places like Luke 21 and Matthew 21. You'll see a number of times where Jesus is on these stairs, teaching, interacting, coming out of the temple to talk with his followers. And I really do hope one day you'll get to go to Jerusalem, go to Israel, and see this with your own eyes. Excellent. Now, Don did warn me that if I go over my five minutes tonight, there is no way he's going to let me speak next week. So <laughs> hopefully it works out. So we're, tonight we're going to talk about miracles. Okay? And we're really going to talk about one type of miracle. So we're not going to talk about the type of miracle where we say it's a miracle Tyler graduated from Bible college. Okay? We're going to talk about actual miracles. So the def miracle definition is a surprising and welcome event that's not explicable by natural or scientific laws, and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency, such as, say, the miracle of rising from the grave. Now, you could go to the graveyard in Vernon and camp out there for 24 hours a day for the next month, and the odds are you probably won't see anybody get up from one of the graves. And you could conclude from that, because this doesn't happen, therefore, there is nobody that ever gets raised from the bed in Vernon, which sounds logical. But to say that it's never happened, you would have to be beside every dead body throughout history and watch them to see that that's never happened. So you can, might say it's improbable, but you cannot say it's impossible because you don't have all the evidence. And just because you haven't experienced something does not make it not true. There's lots of things we haven't experienced. Otherwise, we'd never study history in school to know that it's truth because there's no way we can experience it to know it's true. Right? So there's two main signs that we're going to look at. Those that say that miracles can't happen, and those that wonder, why isn't miracles happening today? So here's the first thing that I want you to be aware of. Miracles happen in the physical world. We're looking for a physical manifestation that we did not expect, outside of science or natural law. So we come to that concept where? In our minds. Are our minds part of the physical world? Can you touch your mind? Can you touch your thought? Think of it more this way, okay? Like a computer program, your brain is like the, the CPU. You are the programmer. You actually exist outside of your brain. It's been scientifically proven. That your thoughts are not contained inside your brain. It's the mechanism to which your thoughts go through. So same thing here. When we talk about miracles, there's an outside agent that comes in that makes something happen. Just like a computer program would change the program or put an anomaly in to change that program for that time. Even though it's not part of the particular rules, as the programmer, you can change that. That makes sense? Okay. Yeah, so there's a lot of evidence that, anybody ever see the movie The Matrix? There's more scientific evidence to say we live in a movie like The Matrix than there is that we live in a natural world. But that's a whole different topic for another day. Okay. So the laws of nature, according to Hume, he's the one that really, he's an English philosopher. He says, um, 
human's account as a miracle is a violation of the law of nature. More specifically, it's a transgression of the law of nature, a particular violation of a deity or by the imposition of some visible agent. We cannot establish that a miracle has occurred by only showing that the laws of nature has been violated because it could be just a chance or a capricious event. And according to Hume, he says there's no testimony sufficient to establish a miracle, which means I don't care what evidence you provide me, I'm never, ever, 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 never going to believe it, which sounds really good. I go back to the statement of Curtis White. He wrote the book, The Science Delusion, debunking all of Richard Dawkins, and he's uh, an atheist. And all he said was, if you can give me the miracle of the Big Bang, I can explain away all the other miracles. So even if you're a naturalist, you still have to explain the miracle how something got created out of nothing, as everybody believes, right? So if God can create something out of nothing, it's reasonable to expect that he can do a miracle in today's age, because the miracle of creation is far greater than healing somebody's leg, something like that. And C.S. Lewis puts it this way. If you had $100 in your hand and you put it in your nightstand, and the next night you'd have another $100 and you put it in your nightstand, and on the third night you go and grab that you know, $200 out and you find $50 there, what law was broken? Was the law of mathematics broken or were the laws of Canada broken? Right? And how do we know the laws of Canada are broken? Because some outside agent went in and took $150 out. So when we see a miracle, we know that some outside agent, being God, has come in and changed the natural laws. Somebody else went in and broke the natural law because he can. That's how we know miracles are possible. So why not now? So why were miracles documented in the Bible? Generally speaking, miracles came about when there was a new revelation or a new prophet, and it was to establish their words as truth. It was a testimony to the person that came. That's where the miracles came from there, right? There is no experiment if you have a miracle. So if we raise somebody from the dead, we can't really go with it scientifically and go, we need to recreate that. So we just raised John from the dead. Let's kill him again and see if we can do it. And we'll repeat that five or six times to make sure we know that people can be raised from the dead. We can't do that. There is no scientific explanation to go back and recreate a miracle. You have to use historical evidence. There's different types of evidence for that. Okay. Now you're wondering, has it happened today? Craig Keener, he wrote a book called Miracles. It's 1,500 pages late long. It has before and after documentation, MRIs, doctor's reports, pictures, all that. 1,500 pages. If you don't want to read that one, he has a shorter book. It's called Miracles Today, Documenting Modern Day Miracles. Okay? It's more than just personal experience, right? And then there's anecdotal evidence. I went on a mission trip to India. And so we were in Northeast India. At that time, there was a book that said, you know, the you know, most dangerous places to visit in the world. And it was a four out of five stars at that time. When we landed, we got arrested because there was a massacre in the streets day before, and we were the first white people in that area for over 20 years. And they were afraid that we were gonna get caught, um, ransomed, kidnapped, all that. So I was never more than you and me away from an M16 guy protecting my life. And we had an open air stadium. It was on a soccer field, somewhere between 50 and 100,000 people that were there one night. And a lady brought her baby up to the stage to get prayed for. And her eyes, the child was only white. There was no cornea, no retina, nothing. So I started praying for this baby. And I physically watched the cornea grow. The iris come into play. Everything come in to where the mother just looked at her child and, and ran off crying. And I thought, oh. And I went and prayed for the next guy and absolutely nothing happened. <laughs> that miracle was for a specific time and place. If miracles happened all the time, would they still be miracles? It was for that specific time. I know miracles can happen because I've seen them. I've seen little ones, I've seen big ones, I've, but they're possible. So should we stop complaining because we haven't seen an evidence or not? Absolutely not. The biggest thing is, is when you're praying for them and you don't get the answer you expect or you get a wait, what should you keep doing? Continue praying. 
Because you need to trust that no matter what the answer is, you are exactly where God has you to be. And if you don't think that, what you're saying is, God, you have me here, I should be over here. Which means, you're wrong, I'm right, this is where I should be. And as soon as you do that, you're not living in reality. You can't do anything from there. It's like being lost in a city, and you don't know which street you're on, and you're grabbing a map, and you're just getting more and more lost. Except that no matter what the answer is, you are exactly where you should be to learn the lesson, but to be most impactful for what God has you to do. Right? So when it comes to apologetics, this is the last night. Yeah, I know gun, I'm, I won't be speaking next week. It's okay, Don. Right? Is when it comes to apologetics and you're sharing the gospel, it's more important to understand the other person and where they're coming from than it is to be right. And I love to be right. But anybody ever like being around that somebody that has to be right all the time? That's why it's more important to understand. Right? If you want to be able to communicate, you have to be able to understand. More importantly, ask questions. Why? Because questions help the seeker discover the answer for themselves. A truth never truly comes alive until you grab onto it yourself. I can give you the answer and you can run with my truth, and when you stumble, you're gonna blame me because it was my truth, it was never yours. If I ask you questions and you discover that truth for yourself, you can run, and when you stumble, you can still hang on to that truth because you've made it your own. Does that make sense? Ask questions. What type of questions are good to ask? How did you come to that conclusion? Have you considered dot, 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 whatever it is? Right? What did you mean by that? And most importantly, if you're going to answer questions, is be prepared for an answer. In my opinion, if you look into the history and the, the word definitions of evangelism, it is not to get people saved. It's to bring people to the point of making a decision. No matter how good of a Christian you are, no matter how good of an evangelist, you are never going to be the one that saves them. That's Jesus' job. Your job is to be prepared for, with an answer. Be prepared. The more prepared I am, the more questions people ask me. I spent the last year and a half diving deep into apologetics. I've never had more people ask me apologetic questions out of the blue, unexpected places, than in the last year because I was prepared with an answer for when they asked. If you want people to ask you about Jesus, prepare yourself for an answer. Look at the other arguments against. Understand where they're coming from so you can have a detailed conversation. Be kind. Understand that most people are coming from a place where they're hurting as well. Right? I'm right, you're wrong. It's, I want to understand you, and you need to consider this truth. Right? And most of all, to the best of your ability, with God's grace and mercy, walk out the message so truth can be seen. Because you might be the only Bible anybody ever reads. Challenges for you guys. So challenge one is with what Amanda was teaching us, like the, the verse, with your family or with a group, if you want to practice what she has taught us, and then record it and send her. You can either email it to Aaron. He'll make sure that Amanda gets it. And um, that way it'd be an encouragement to her to see that we actually learn something. Um, I think that it's important for teachers, but also the value of doing that of, of learning as well for ourselves. Challenge two, you can pick any of these. Uh, think about one thing over the five for faith, one thing that grabbed your attention and just do a little bit of research on that. Uh, whether maybe if it was the life of Luther, uh, I know down in the kids library we've likely got more stories on the life of Luther or if it was on the Israel and the archeology span kind of stuff. Uh, just do research on one area of, uh, one area that it grabbed your attention and then the third challenge, option for a challenge, is to share one thing with somebody this week that you've learned while you were at Five for Faith. So either record the memory verse, get together with a group, whether friends or family, record it and send it to Amanda, or you can send it to anyone particularly. It doesn't have to be only Amanda. Two, think of one thing that grabbed your attention, do some more research in that. And then the third one was share one thing with somebody that you have learned during Five for Faith. 
Um, I'm going to pray in a minute, but first of all, just want to thank a few people. Um, first of all, thank you to all of you, whether watching at home or those who have come out each week. Uh, we <laughs> so here's how it works. We meet together in Don's office, this is especially during the last couple of years. And we're like, hey, we normally do this thing. And we're like, yeah, but that's not going to quite fly. What could we do? And sometimes the ideas are kind of crazy. And then it always comes to that point. Do you think anyone would ever come? Um, and so it's just been a real blessing to see you guys come out. And just real encouraging to see the fellowship and to see you guys be encouraged by that. Or even people watching at home. Um, and just to, to watch those who are watching live or even through the course of the week, those numbers will go up. And so I appreciate all you guys for just being good to roll with the punches and jump in. So thank you for that. And I want to thank the tech team. Um, there's been a bunch of them that have served every week. Um, and then also the guest presenters or speakers. And then also the, either the families or the people that shared uh, either testimonies or just in the meet the family stuff. And then the nursery volunteers who were downstairs. There was people who sacrificially give up being in here. And then they went downstairs to look after the kids. And then thanks to the staff just for sharing as well. And then the Russell family Food Connection, come on in. So we should give them a round of applause, I think. <laughs> the food has been really good. Thank you, guys. And it's added to the event. So we really appreciate you guys putting in the effort and just making the food for us and having it ready for us and also chatting with us as well. So thank you so much for that. And I think that's it all, all for now. So let me pray and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you again just for our time together for Five for Faith and uh, Lord, again, it's just, it's good to, to be together. It's good to study your word. It's good even, I know I was encouraged seeing some of the, um, the archaeology of, of Israel and just how it tied in with, with Bible passages. And Lord, I just know I found that an encouragement. Lord, it was just encouraging to, to learn scripture as a church family together. Lord, it was, it was just being, just neat opportunity. And Lord, we just thank you for this gift. We just thank you for your faithfulness with us. And Lord, just pray that you would continue to watch over us, watch over our church, and may we grow, may we be strong, may we walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling that we have received. And Father, help us to make uh, that a priority in our lives, we pray. Lord, we uh, pray, I pray even for the kids who have been out each week, and I'm thankful for them. And I just pray, Lord, that you would continue to ground them in their faith. Help them, Lord. You know, it's not always easy to be a Christian in schools, and so, Lord, I pray for them even this week, Lord, that you would help them and encourage them even as they seek to honor you in that environment. Father, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys, so much for coming.